Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, and let me try to get to sharing the screen. Um, sorry about this. Uh, man, we had set this all up, Ellen, and then I blew it. So let me see. That's okay, I'm no problem. I'm lost in screens right now. <laughs> Uh, where is the share screen? It'll be a green button at the bottom of the Zoom. Okay, share screen. Mm. There you go. Okay. Can everyone see the screen now? Does it look okay? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. All right. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Um, I see that we've got people as well as cats in attendance, which is awesome. Um, and um, I, uh, I'm going to go over a lot of material today. And so I did ask uh, Ms. Dunn to record this um, just so people can have as a reference. Um, I'm also going to simplify things quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to gloss over a lot of uh, uh, items that um, uh, just to make it more um, uh, applicable to the, the, the general public. Um, but. I, I think it is worth pointing out that in some of these oversimplifications that uh, there are some important points that might be missed. So the difference between specific anatomical regions versus the connectivity between these regions. Um, there are some pretty big things that have uh, implications for treatment as well as understanding the cause of disease and, and the, the basis for benefits that um, I think um, uh, I always like to just say, say that at the beginning when I give a presentation like this uh, for the lay public that it is, it, I am intentionally trying to oversimplify things. And if people contact me, um, I can, I can uh, give them more detail if they would like. So with all of those caveats, um, I'll begin here. So let's see. So the goal today, I have sort of uh, three main parts. So one is to talk about the impact of senses and the senses and subconscious in general on decision making uh, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, part two is going to be the interactions between music and the brain. And uh, part three is uh, going to be regarding uh, the potential for music therapy in Alzheimer's disease. I'm also going to spend about uh, two minutes at the very, very end uh, just to introduce two ongoing studies that are related to this that people might be interested in. So when we talk about the brain, um, there's a couple of takeaways uh, that I think we, we need to, to uh, set forth um, uh, before we can get to music specifically and hearing, the sense of hearing. And so um, these deal with um, the other senses that we know a lot more about, uh, in particular vision, uh, that are rel relevant for um, um, hearing and music and uh, also the subconscious, uh, which is just uh, a monster in terms of uh, its impacts on the brain. Monster, not in a bad way, monster in terms of it's just size. It's just uh, the bulk of uh, uh, the basis for why we do what we do and why we don't do certain things. So um, all of this deals with the brain, which you see here. It's about a two pound mass between our ears that uh, pretty much uh, does everything. It's responsible for uh, only, you know, 2% or less of our body weight, yet it consumes 20% of the oxygen that we use on, a gen on a, any given day. And it's responsible for 20% of our en energy expenditure. So even when we're sitting there doing nothing, we're doing a lot because of our brain. Um, and really, it goes from, um, for example, um, can people see the cursor here? I'm going to try to point at a couple of things. Okay. So the idea here is, is that when we move from sort of the higher level function going uh, from left to right, 
all the way over to breathing and controlling of temperature. Um, you know, all of these things are necessary for life and necessary for our ability to interact with the uh, environment and how successful or unsuccessful we are in that. And um, all of these things are, you know, necessary for us to be, to be human. And so if we move from uh, taking these sort of abstract things of thinking and memory versus breathing and temperature to what it is to make us human, we can look at things like planning and completing uh, daily activities, moving in our environment, social engagement, learning to do new things, emotions, emotions kind of blend through all of these all the way down to very basic aspects of life. And we know that in early dementia, these things are differentially affected. So, and that's because in dementia, uh, all cause dementia, that uh, the brain is the primary target uh, for the, the deficits that we see. And any of uh, anyone who has uh, been around an individual with any type of dementia knows that it's not, uh, the dementia doesn't affect all aspects of um, daily life or functioning of the brain. It's somewhat selective and um, what we call hierarchical. So it starts at some of these higher level functions and kind of works its way down. One thing to keep in mind is that it also is very important in terms of the, um, uh, there, there's a heterogeneity. There's differences in everybody who has a, a dementia. Just because you have an Alzheimer's dementia doesn't mean that your course is, is guaranteed to go a certain way. There, there are surprises along the way, both good and bad. And, but we do know that as the disease progresses, what, regardless of the dementia, that more and more of these aspects are affected uh, of the brain and that um, those very basic functions uh, remain intact until the very end. What may be surprising to people is just how much the brain works. So, you know, there are 11 million bits of sensory information that the brain has to decipher and interpret and react to uh, every second. And um, I think what's surprising to most people is that the conscious mind handles less than 0.01% of this. And, and I guess the easiest way to think about it is, um, you know, one way to look at this uh, is to say that we couldn't handle the fire hose of information that's coming to us at a conscious level. Uh, we're trying to reserve as much brain function as we can that we uh, quote unquote control for those decisions that are the most important. And, um, but this is very important. And I'm gonna hit on this again and again and again is that the fact that the subconscious either directly makes the decision for us or influences the, the decisions of 90% or more of what we do, uh, that has implications for Alzheimer's disease and perhaps even more in the case of Alzheimer's disease than a non-demented individual. Um, these subconscious uh, and sensory inputs become more and more important on the outcomes of an individual versus someone who is uh, non-demented. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So again, most of the decisions that you make on a daily basis are made or influenced by our subconscious mind. Um, it's greater than 90%. There are two great books. Uh, there are many great books. These are two of the ones that are most cited, uh, Adam Grant and Daniel Kahneman. Very good reads for anybody that's interested in this type of topic um, are good starting points. Um, subconscious is referred to in these books as system one. Um, the conscious system is referred to as system two. Conscious requiring, of course, more energy and more attention than the 90 plus percent of brain function that goes on at the subconscious level. And the subconscious makes quick decisions. Um, those things that we, you know, the um, um, uh, flight or fight types of responses um, that uh, we, we can't take time to decide what we want to do. But in addition to those, it colors in, fills in, and biases, uh, uh, both good and bad, uh, are uh, decision making. And just going to give you a couple of examples here. So the Yale Hotter Code coffee experiment, just again to show you uh, sort of how little in control we are even without the presence of dementia in terms of making our decisions. We're heavily influenced by the subconscious. So in this Yale uh, experiment, what they did was they had uh, individuals who were participating in the study uh, they were intentionally met in the hallway by an assistant who was, had their hands full, and in their left hand, they had an um, 
either a hot cup of coffee or an iced coffee. And they ask for the participant to uh, give them a hand by holding this cup. And so some of the people got the hot coffee to hold, some of the people got the cold coffee to hold. And at, uh, um, they didn't know this was part of the experiment, of course, because psychology experiments are very weird and twisted in that way oftentimes where people don't know when the experiment actually begins. But they were asked later that day to complete a short story about an individual that, um, uh, to, or to make judgments on the short story. Everyone got the same short story about this individual. And the individuals who got the cold coffee uh, viewed the individual um, uh, greater than 50% as being cold, unsocial, or selfish. The people that got the hot coffee, uh, again, they didn't drink it. They were just holding it in their hand. Uh, that stimulation was enough to uh, make them view the same person as nice, outgoing, and generous. Um, some other visual examples, these um, uh, visual tricks um, that you know, are often out there. Again, it's just your subconscious playing um, tricks uh, on, your, um, on your brain in terms of its ability to perceive and understand. Um, this is one that's um, still, it's pretty disturbing. So this image of these two tables, these two tables, uh, uh, if I asked you which of these tables was longer or which of them was wider, uh, you, you undoubtedly, you know, pick the longer one on the left and the one that is, uh, you know, shorter, the one on the right. But this is the shepherd's tabletop illusion. Uh, believe, believe it or not, these two tables are exactly the same. Both of these tables are exactly three by two. And uh, you can uh, go and measure them uh, or read about it on Wikipedia, for example, these, uh, this illusion. Um, again, it's your, your subconscious is uh, feeding your conscious mind information uh, based on three-dimensional shapes, and it is incorporating those even though this is not a uh, three-dimensional design. Here's another illusion where if I asked you, is the black line on the left connected to the red or the blue line, you would say it's the red line. However, uh, I'm sorry, you would say it's the blue line. However, it is definitely not. It's the red line. They still don't know the basis for this. It's called the Pagendorf illusion. But again, it's a subconscious influence uh, on, on decision making. Um, then we have things of the impossible triton. This is a famous one where your mind is filling in. When you look at this side of the diagram, you're filling in that this middle uh, bar exists. However, it's impossible. It cannot exist. And um, so you see in the same image, when you look to the right, you say, oh, it is a more of a magnet shape. When you look to the left, you say, oh, it is a fork. And um, this is, uh, there's nothing wrong with you. This is just uh, an illusion um, that, uh, again, your subconscious uh, is filling in. 30% uh, of your brain is dedicated to vision. So these visual illusions are innumerable. Your, your brain doesn't actually see all of the, uh, a lot of times the images that uh, we interpret as, as being complete, your brain will fill those in. And that's, that's largely how a lot of these illusions are done. But it's important to recognize the influence of the senses uh, and subconscious in the context of AD. So for example, here we have uh, an individual, uh, let's just say that this is the, this uh, lady's uh, father. Uh, let's say that he is uh, in the early stages of dementia and she is working with him on uh, using email, for example. And uh, uh, she wants him to work on an email to a grandson or granddaughter. And uh, he has uh, uh, got a lot going on uh, because he is, he is not only listening to her, he is, uh, he, he's having to interact with this computer. He's having to interact with her. Everything that she says, all of the the touches, for example, it appears she's touching him on the shoulder. She's, she's clearly smiling. Um, so uh, he is uh, having to take this task of let's interact with this computer, uh, this order. All of the senses are playing a role in how his brain interacts with that. But even more importantly, his subconscious is playing a role in that. And ultimately, that dictates the outcome. And one way to look at that is, is that at a minimum, this individual is uh, having frontal lobe involvement where he's being, what am I being asked to do? Um, 
He has emotional state involvement with the limbic system, in particular the amygdala, feeling, am I loved? Is this person mad? Uh, is, this, is this something that I ultimately want to do? And at the most basic level, he is um, you know, asking at a brainstem level, uh, you know, am I safe in this environment? And um, this is something that I always do when I give talks about Alzheimer's disease. I think it's important that, you know, you always have to remember that to put yourself in their shoes. And it's, it's hard because we don't have dementia. Uh, and, but what I always try to uh, explain to individuals is that, um, you know, just take your own instance when you don't have dementia, when you don't understand the world around you, it is, it is a very frustrating place. When you don't know what to expect, that frustration turns to something that's more frightening. And that we, um, we need to keep these into account whenever we interact with someone with a dementia or to plan their day or to, to have them get about. And um, we need to, to harness these in beneficial ways when possible uh, to, to help that person get through the day. And, and art in particular, music, is one of those things that may play an important role in beneficially uh, getting that individual through their day. It is also important just to keep in mind, this is one I always uh, try to incorporate too, is that um, it's important to, to know that we literally are not wired the same. Uh, and that um, uh, this has implications for how we'll respond to a stimulus. We don't all respond equally in, in the absence of dementia to the same stimulus. One, one famous example, I'm sure many of you have seen the documentary Free Solo. Um, Alex Honnold um, climbed El Capitan um, free, free climbing. So uh, for hours and hours on the surface of this granite, uh, one slip, he falls, he dies. Um, he's driven to do this. It's a great documentary for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, one person that I worked with at the University of Kentucky, um, specialist in functional MRI, um, is, uh, was able to uh, image uh, Alex's brain um, in response to fearful stimuli within the magnet uh, and compare it to other uh, experienced climbers uh, of similar age and uh, look at the differences uh, in brain activation in response to those stimuli. And so uh, if you look at these crosshairs here, what we have is, um, well, this is an individual's brain. So the, um, we're looking at it cross-sectionally. So this would be um, if the individual is turned uh, like this and looking out. And so you're just um, doing a cross-section of the brain this way. And um, the crosshairs are in an area of the brain called the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system and involved uh, in, in a lot of emotion uh, control regulation. And what we see here is that the gentleman on the uh, right-hand side here in response to the, the images, uh, the, the fearful images um, uh, is having a much higher intensity. It's red. Um, here we're seeing that the, this is the visual uh, uh, cortex back here. It's being lit up, of course, because they're looking at these images. But right here, you can see in the crosshairs, the amygdala is red. And on um, Mr. Uh, Honnold's a brain in response to those same stimuli, it is absent. So Mr. Honnell does not respond uh, uh, even at a basic level in the brain in response to um, fearful stimuli. Um, he is literally wired differently. And uh, this is a dramatic case, but I use it as an example to, um, in this in response to fear, this individual is much more fearful in response to the same stimuli and, as opposed to Mr. Honnell. And so we have to keep in mind that the, our individuals that we love and work with uh, um, with dementia uh, ha have different wiring and we need to know their propensities for um, uh, how they interact. And it's important to pay attention to that, uh, to know how they may be similar or different to what you may expect. Uh, so now the interactions between music and the brain, that was all as a precursor and the spoiler alert uh, is that we have a very good understanding of the interactions between most senses and the subconscious and conscious in terms of decision making. Uh, touch, smell, vision, all of these are very well understood and they're used extensively by marketing um, people to influence uh, our uh, propensity to buy certain items. Um, the most of the work that's been done in this area is in the sense of um, um, uh, neuroscience of marketing. And um, 
we are, the more you dive into that field, the more you realize how little power we have over commercials and the way stores are designed and the way that different packaging works. It dramatically influences our decision making. It's not an accident that it's a multi-billion dollar business. It, it actually works. Um, unfortunately, uh, and just as an example, like with smell, if there is a citrus smell at the counter um, uh, of a checkout, um, people are more likely to, to make an additional purchase or to pick up an impulse buy. That's why you see that a lot, particularly within clothing retailers, um, the citrus smell near the, the, the counter. Um, I gave an example of touch um, uh, with the coffee. Uh, vision. I gave some ex ex examples. Oh, I've got smell twice here. I'm sorry about that. Um, I gave some examples of vision, the, the, the illusions. But on, on music, we, we unfortunately know a lot less. We're, we're still learning how the brain hears, uh, how we hear music. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But, but suffice it to say, just because we don't know a lot about this does not mean that it doesn't play an important role. It's just a limitation in our measures. We're just not able to uh, measure those things as accurately as, um, as we can for the other senses. So what is music? So at its most basic, um, music is a purposeful pattern of sound and silence. And that can come from very primitive um, uh, things, just using your hands or your um, uh, uh, voice uh, to, to make music all the way up into electronic or techno types of music. So this is a very broad term, but in general, it's just uh, intentful sound uh, alterations in sound and silence. Um, there are uh, three fundamental components. So um, I have a lot more of this at the end of the talk, which I'm gonna show when we do question and answer, just so it's recorded and people can use that. But I think it's too much for the general audience here. So suffice it to say that there is um, there are time, components, and we know that uh, as in the lay public as rhythm, uh, pitch, um, which we know as frequency, so um, the frequency of the music, so high, high, how high or high, how low the, the, the sound of the music is. And then there's timbre, which is just um, a timbre, sorry, which is uh, much more difficult to explain and measure, again, holding up the field of music. Uh, therapy, uh, but it's a very important component. And the easiest way or the easiest selection that I know of is that um, comparing a voice um, uh, when someone is singing a particular piece versus an instrumental uh, mimicking of the voice. So that is to, um, uh, that is timbre. Timbre is the difference between the voice and the instrument, even though the rhythm and the pitch may be the same. For a particular piece, one is a voice and one is, for example, a violin. Um, so there we have the, the, the parts of music. It's really crazy to think about, um, you know, I think it's a lot easier for us to understand, you know, something like touch where we have these sensory uh, inputs and we feel different things um, uh, and how, how our brain is able to put that together. It's much more difficult really when when you really think about music, music is, um, uh, it is uh, patterns, uh, 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 vibrations within the air that come into our skull through um, a, a canal, but then interact with uh, a tympanic membrane here in the eardrum that vibrate a few bones that then um, move a liquid within a uh, the, the cochlea, which then Inert hairs within that system move 10,000 to 20,000 hairs, depending on how much ear damage that you have, um, move uh, and then transmit a, single, a signal that ultimately goes to the auditory cortex. Uh, that is a lot of moving parts. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we, know, we know a lot about how this particular system works, the outer, middle and inner ear. From here, when a signal is received, to how we perceive that signal, we know a lot less, but we're gaining a lot more knowledge through functional MRI. And I'm gonna show you some of those, some of these images here. Um, this is one, before I get to that, this is the brain. So again, this would be, uh, this is the, the back part of the brain. This is where the eyes would be. So this would be if the brain is turned 
uh, looking outward. So again, the eyes here, uh, the back of the skull here. And along this fissure, if you imagine uh, taking uh, a uh, instrument and peeling away at this fissure here uh, and to look, there is an actual anatomical region uh, depicted here that, that physically is responsible for detecting higher frequency. So it is an anatomical basis with which we detect uh, higher levels of frequency. Um, on the other side of this fissure is our secondary auditory cortex. We know a lot less about that, but we know that it is important for um, uh, the other components of music, for example, that I, I presented in the earlier slide. So pitch, here we have it with the um, um, uh, almost exclusively measured within the primary auditory cortex. So this would be like right behind your ears. Uh, this is in the um, uh, 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 temporal lobe of the brain. And I'll probably get to that at the end of the talk, depending on how much time we yeah. have. Uh, pitch and timbre co-localized. This is an image of the brain uh, where now we're doing it cross-sectionally. Um, so a coronal section. So in this instance, here would be the eyes. We, th this would be the brain looking out at an individual. So it's, it's looking at you. And we just look through it cross-sectionally. Here are the ears. Uh, of the individual. Uh, and so uh, the ears would actually be right up in here. And so what we're looking at here is in response to a piece of music, um, the, uh, this individual uh, where they altered the pitch or the, the timbre uh, were uh, um, looking at what parts of the brain were activated. That's how we as uh, anatomists try to uh, understand which part of the brain is involved in different aspects of uh, different functions, whether it be Alzheimer's disease, walking, whatever it may be. We try to visualize the, the individual in the magnet and see what, what, what pieces of the brain are being activated or how do these pieces uh, interact with one another um, in response to uh, a given activity. So pitch located uh, here, again, all within the, the primary and secondary auditory cortex. Uh, timbre, same thing. Here you're looking at them together, red, you can see where they overlap. You can see there's a tremendous amount of overlap there anatomically. Um, the detection of time or rhythm is in a completely different anatomical area. It, is, um, it involves a lot of what we call the basal ganglia. Um, it's an area of the brain that is uh, deteriorated in Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, much less so in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that may be why there is so much benefit and understanding of music therapy in the context of Parkinson's disease um, and strongly implicated time and rhythm uh, into uh, um, our ability to sense these things. And I want to just say right here, this is a good stopping point to, to mention that um, uh, just look at we in response to one given piece of music, we have... <laughs> at least 12 different anatomical regions of the brain that are involved in instantly perceiving that music uh, for us to understand it. There is not one single domain that's responsible for our ability to hear uh, or to understand music. Uh, it appears instantaneous as if it's happening in one area, but it's not. It's this, it's, it is multiple aspects of the brain that somehow instantly fuse these, this input together to make us feel uh, uh, or to interact um, uh, in response to, to a piece of music. Um, it is a full brain workout. Um, and, and that's just depicted here where um, it is incredible that um, something as complex as music appears um, uh, so easy for us to, to enjoy and, and interpret. There's a lot going on in the brain for that to happen. And I'm gonna give you a couple of really quirky things here in just a moment. Uh, this is a very busy slide, but again, this is being recorded. These are just some of the areas of the brain that are involved in the different aspects of hearing music, perceiving music, and to be able to understand the music that's being played. Uh, to further add to that complexity, we don't understand this, but the brain responds differently to familiar versus non-familiar music. 
So there may be a reason why uh, those jingles stick in your head as well as they do. Um, that it is a uh, very different anatomy that's involved uh, in uh, perceiving familiar versus non-familiar music. Um, I'm just gonna show, I'm not even gonna go into this, but when in response to familiar music versus unfamiliar music, these are the areas that are preferentially involved in response to, the, to hearing familiar um, 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 jingles, familiar songs versus unfamiliar, uh, and in often cases, unstructured music. It's, it's a completely different anatomy that, that allows us to perceive that. One interesting thing in terms of Alzheimer's disease is that uh, one of the areas that's, uh, it's not one area, one of the constructs that's involved uh, in our ability to um, uh, have um, uh, memory for certain uh, songs or music uh, depicted here uh, in the brain is an area that's largely preserved from the loss of brain material during dementia. Uh, here as gray matter atrophy, meaning the loss of cortex uh, in the brain. It's an area that doesn't undergo the decreases in metabolism that are seen in advanced dementia. Uh, here being the more red um, is a greater loss of uh, metabolism or energy use. And it's an area that's relatively spared from the, the uh, accumulations of beta amyloid. So one of the potentially pathological uh, proteins that accumulates in the brain of individuals with dementia. Um, there, is, there are conditions um, such as stroke which have also greatly uh, informed our understanding of how people perceive music uh, as well as other um, aspects of being human. Um, so I think everyone is familiar with strokes that can occur that uh, result in aphasia. So the ability of individuals to speak or to read or to communicate or all three of those items, depending on the severity of the stroke and the localization of the stroke. There's also over a hundred years of evidence that strokes can cause people to not be able to um, comprehend or reproduce music. Uh, and that's called amusia. And um, there are again, multiple areas of the brain involved in our ability to understand music. Um, we know that some people who have a stroke uh, and uh, lose the ability to comprehend or produce, uh, reproduce music, uh, this amusia, amusia. We know that some of them recover and we know some of them don't recover. And what we know is, is that this dorsal connectivity of the brain, the ability of the brain to connect uh, in, in, in at least uh, two domains uh, is essential for the ability to recover from a stroke that causes amusia um, because in both instances of where amusia is not recovered or recovered, there are, there are disruptions that occur in, in ventrally that uh, are present in both instances. Uh, so we know that this preservation of dorsal connectivity is what's key to people ultimately being able to recover the ability uh, to, to, to not have sustained amusia. And the reason I'm showing this is because it's, it's important for um, uh, Alzheimer's disease in that here is an instance of where we know that in, in the context of music that there is plasticity. There is definitely an ability for an adult brain to undergo change, to be able to respond to music um, uh, even in a disease state like stroke. So we believe that this is also something that is going to be able to be reproduced in a, in a slower neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's disease. Plasticity often is good. We associate that with good. The more, the more that these neurons can make new connections and branch out and, and um, uh, create new functions is a good thing. Music seems to be one of the things that, 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 that it can be recoverable. It's also just flat out interesting that you can have individuals, for example, if a stroke occurs in Broca's area, uh, that's one where individuals often lose the ability to speak, yet those same individuals can sing. So it tells us that singing and speaking 
are in completely different anatomical areas uh, or involve at least networks that are completely different. Um, and so this, these kinds of slides help start, the mo start people thinking like, wow, this is really, uh, music and hearing are very different than, um, uh, uh, it's not simple. Uh, and you know, not being connected to speech is, is a dramatic um, example of that. Musicians' brains are very different than non-musicians' brain. Um, this is a study that was done, and I have the citations here, and all the citations that you see throughout the presentation are ones that are publicly available. I intentionally pick them so that individuals can go online and find them uh, and read more about them. They're, they're, even though this is complex, it is approachable. And um, this is a study, this is a very complex image, but what it shows is what they did was they took individuals of equal age people that were non-musicians, people that were amateur musicians, and people that were professional musicians. And otherwise, they are uh, um, identical. And what they did was they looked at the connectivity of the brains of those individuals. And I won't go into all the detail on what this tells us, other than you just need to know that the, the, the individuals with the professional musicians uh, are different than, than amateur musicians or uh, non-musicians, um, uh, and that musicians, uh, amateur musicians, are different than um, non-musicians, and both amateur musicians and professional musicians have more cortical connections than non-musicians. And this actually affects the way that they hear music. When an individual, I think I, yeah, I didn't include it, so there's a lot of work that's been done to show that whenever someone who is a musician hears the same piece of music as an individual who is not a musician, there is a much greater robust response and more activation of areas of the brain in the musician than the non-musician, musician, which again is consistent with the ability to, um, and the, I'm gonna spill the beans here on music therapy, is that it's not enough, it, it is a workout for the brain to listen to music. It's even more of a workout to play it or to participate, either through singing or keeping up with the rhythm. And it appears that this um, uh, uh, higher level of uh, participation is very important for the effectiveness of uh, music therapy, particularly in the context of dementia. So before I move on here, I just wanna highlight again, um, music, uh, uh, interactions with music, particularly playing music, um, dramatically alter brain anatomy, dramatically alter the ability of um, the brain to uh, interact with music in the future, uh, both of those in a positive way. Um, music, uh, the domains involved in music uh, awareness appear to be able to uh, change in the context of neurodegenerative disease and to uh, reform or to become active again when they're lost. So um, again, highlighting the potential importance for um, interventions that use music therapy in, in diseases like Alzheimer's. So now that's what I'm gonna talk about. So, you know, I hate to be negative, but, but the field of music therapy is way behind um, the, the, the work that's been done with stroke or Parkinson's disease. Uh, there's just been a lot of poorly designed studies. Um, it is important how a study is designed to be able to make an interpretation. So you have to have a sufficient number of participants. You have to use valid assessments. You need to have a rigorous design, a controlled design. And that's just flat out lacking uh, from the vast majority of literature that's out there on uh, music therapy in the context of dementia. Um, there's also uh, an important role for personalization. So you need, you need to have the participants' music preferences uh, incorporated within um, the um, therapy that is administered. Um, you need to have people that are trained. It's, it doesn't require an extensive music degree, but there's a, there is um, uh, an aspect of training that is important for the consistency of uh, music therapy administration. Group size seems to be important. Groups can be too small or too big. Seems the four to eight is the sweet spot in terms of um, the number of people per session uh, with dementia to participate in a music therapy session. And we need more reproducibility of the, the studies um, to, to, to ultimately get evidence-based uh, approaches. Uh, but that all said, 
the data that we have out there suggests that, um, uh, yeah, suggests that active music engagement is much better than passive engagement. Uh, um, uh, and where I'm going with this is there are hundreds of studies on music therapy in the context of dementia. And even if you take in their weaknesses, there are trends that uh, pop through that appear to uh, inform what an optimal intervention would have. And so having people be engaged versus just sitting and listening, um, that group settings uh, of four to eight individuals are better than individual um, doing it on a one-on-one -on -one or to do it in groups of 40 or more, for example. There's a minimum of six to 12 sessions that are 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, each that are required to start seeing benefit. The effects are reversible when music um, therapy stops, um, the uh, beneficial effects uh, revert, uh, meaning that it should be ongoing. Um, it helps with cognition, psychiatric symptoms, depression, agitation. Um, it seems all of these aspects are benefited from um, music therapy when it is effective. And it can be used at any stage of dementia. It's not something that has to be applied early on, which is very exciting. Um, I have here two studies. Again, you can look these up and um, uh, just Google. Um, and um, the, uh, these studies have enough detail uh, about them that they can be reproduced. Um, and in these instances, there were 12 sessions, 45 minutes. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you the the multiple benefit of beneficial effects that these patients observed, uh, these Alzheimer's patients. Uh, and this one, um, uh, they got as few as two weeks, but very intensive uh, um, sessions um, with the music therapy. And again, I'll, I'll let you go to the papers to, to get the details on how the music therapy session was run. Um, this is just to show that cognition, um, Oh, good Lord, I didn't put that on there. This is overall improved function. This is activities of daily living. And here is psychiatric symptoms improvement. So what, what we see here is here's control. Here is the music therapy uh, where there's just passive listening. And here is where the individual is engaged in the music, either with tambourine, singing, or both. And so you can see that there is a dramatic going from 20% uh, improvement to 80% improvement in cognition uh, through the um, uh, active engagement with the music versus passive or control conditions. Uh, similar here with the activities of daily living and uh, reduction of psychiatric symptoms. So just to recap, um, uh, we always wanna be aware of the influence um, and impact of the census and subconscious on uh, dementia patients. So um, particularly as the disease progresses, it's not necessarily, um, for those of you all heard me talk before, I always, you know, as the disease progresses, it becomes less important what you say and more important how you say it. Uh, so nonverbal communication becomes more and more important. The senses and their subconscious uh, uh, involvement in our perceptions of our environment um, and decision-making become more and more important as the disease progresses. So what we want to do is to harness that so that we have fewer things that are negatively impacting uh, the patient uh, and the patient's decision-making. We want to use senses and subconscious in a positive way. Music may be one of those positive ways in all likelihood is one of those positive ways. Uh, we just need to do a lot more work on it. Um, and uh, that work is gonna be slower than other areas like physical activity because it's easier to measure um, 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 most out, it's easier to measure most sensory uh, functions um, as compared to uh, hearing or music, just much more difficult, um, and, but we're getting a better handle on it. All evidence suggests that when music is beneficial, uh, it's conducted between at least six to 12 sessions, uses at least 30 to 60 minutes. It's interactive. It's in a group setting, but a smaller group setting, and it needs to be ongoing. Um, I was now going to switch over. Um, I have approximately two minutes, and I'm going to be right on time for a 50-minute presentation and allow some question and answer. So the, we have two studies that are ongoing that might be of interest to this group. One is called the UT Austin study, and that's where we're validating tablets 
uh, that uh, measure um, the ability of people to do some simple matching, some simple games, if you will, but these aren't really games. These are actual cognitive assessments in the, in the form of a game, as well as uh, analyzing speech patterns. We ask you to tell certain stories or to, to, to speak. And uh, this tool, um, this study is being done at UT Austin, as well as here at Pennington Biomedical. We're looking for folks that are all the way from cognitively normal to uh, Alzheimer's disease and consist of two 20 minute sessions. And um, the, the ultimate goal of this is to make something that can be used in the lobby of primary care. While people are waiting to see their doctor, they can interact with the device in a very simple way. The idea is ultimately to get this to three minutes to be able to make determinations about a global uh, determination about people's cognitive function. And the second one then related is a study that we're doing with Merck, where we are taking people, in this case, people with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, and we're doing repeated assessments. So these are um, approximately one hour sessions, but they occur over consecutive days, so three days. And the reason why we're doing this is that um, when we're looking for drugs and different interventions to um, uh, slow Alzheimer's or prevent Alzheimer's disease or the development of cognitive impairment, we need to uh, have better tools. Our tools now are okay, adequate, but they need to be improved. And this particular study is honing in on what would be the most optimal way to understand where somebody is cognitively uh, normal or impaired or developing a dementia and what is the quickest way to do that so that we can um, do it in the most efficient manner possible. So if anyone is interested in either of these studies or learning more about what we're doing at uh, the IDRP, the Institute for Dementia Research and Prevention, they can contact me here, um, Jeff Keller, Jeffrey Keller at pdrc.edu. I hope this was beneficial to you and um, look forward to answering your questions. I am gonna go on while we're doing the question and answer and just show a few more slides just so they're recorded and uh, people that are interested can get that additional information. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Keller. That was a wonderful and informative presentation. Um, I'm gonna give everybody a couple minutes. If anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and um, type them into the chat. Um, and I will send Dr. Keller's email address out after the presentation in the follow-up email in case anybody um, has any more questions or is interested in either of those research studies. Um, Okay, so we have a comment and some question, a couple of um, comments, questions, Dr. Keller. So uh, Gina Rossi commented, fascinating, isn't it? So this is very, so educational. Um, and then we have one question. Uh, do participants in the cognitive assessment studies need to be diagnosed by anyone beyond their PCP? Or do you diagnose once they have been recruited? Uh, the answer is uh, you don't need an official diagnosis. So if you suspect that you're having some problem or you've been identified as having a problem or you're cognitively normal, either of these studies, you know, you could participate in either one of these studies. Uh, we do not require further workup and we would be doing additional workup here. So good question. Thank you. Okay. We have a few more um comments for you in the chat, some nice comments. I'm gonna go ahead and save those and I'll send those to you afterwards. We can give it a couple minutes, see if we get any more questions in, Let's see. Um, okay, this one says, I'm curious if the study show participants of four to eight. I would think it depends on personality. My <laughs> husband responds well to solo immersion. Anything you can comment on that? Yes, yeah, so um, that's a very good, point and I try to you know when I mentioned about we're wired differently in terms of fear and response to the same stimuli that holds of course as we know nobody no two people are exactly alike and we also know that as dementia develops it's it's impossible to to know exactly how one individual is going to progress so just because an individual was perhaps shy before doesn't mean that they're not going to become uh, disinhibited and wildly engaging uh, as the dementia develops. Um, and so, yes, there, music, interve music interventions would not be appropriate for people that are deaf, um, even though the brain does, inter it's interesting when, when, when people who are blind hear music, they hear it in a different way than people who don't have uh, blindness or visual impairment. Um, 
And so um, just throwing that out there. Uh, the, the music therapy is not appropriate for everyone. Um, there are individuals who would benefit from doing one-on-one -on -one sessions because their aversion to groups are so great that they would not be able to participate in a group or they would be so disruptive in a group it wouldn't um, make sense to have them in a, in, in a group setting. Um, so yeah, you do have to take these things one-on-one -on -one, and that's again part of this generality with which my presentation was put together. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like that's all the questions we have for now. Oh, hey, never mind. A couple more just came in. Um, what is your opinion related to the dementia assessments conducted by professionals and some example, the Folstein Mini Mental? Which one do you believe is better? So clinicians are under, um, they, they have a lot of um, problems in that um, they have time constraints, specialty constraints, um, setting constraints. Um, they cannot deliver an optimal uh, exam. And so uh, under most instances, particularly in primary care. So what they're forced to do is to, to try to make the most of a very limited amount of time. The problem is those measures, um, which is why, for example, this cognitive platform with Merck is ongoing, is that um, things like the, the Folstein, Mini Mental, MOCA, all of those are just what we call um, gross or blunt measures of global cognitive function. So they're not a very, they're not a, we all know they're not a very good tool to understand what's going on, but they're very easy tests to administer and they are related to the development and progression of dementia, but we need better. And so which of those do I prefer? I prefer none of them, but I understand why people use them. And we're trying to change that by having other tools that can be used by professionals uh, and to hopefully be able to deliver them to prior to the visit uh, with a clinician or to do it 100% remotely. And uh, that's where the field is going. And that's more along the lines of the UT Austin study. And uh, there's a lot of advances being made there. But um, yeah, it's not, far, it's far from perfect. I understand why they use them. They should continue to use them until we develop better tools. Thank you so much. Um, we have another comment from Stephanie. She said, this was absolutely fascinating, particularly appreciate seeing the study results and I'm looking forward to digging into these results in the future. Um, and that looks like all of our questions that we have for now, Dr. Keller, and just wanna be able to respect your time and just wanna say um, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'll send out, like I said, the recording afterwards in case anybody needs to, wants to follow up with the information or wants yeah. to see the slides over again. So Sounds thank great. you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And y'all keep up the good work at Alzheimer's Services. And I uh, want to thank everybody again for attending and uh, um, continuing to help everybody fight this horrible disease and uh, stay safe. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. You'll have a nice afternoon.